All right, welcome everyone to the final meeting of tapers for the year. Um, today, we're happy to have Robert Ledun, who's going to tell us about representation stability for zero HECA modules. So go ahead. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so yeah, so today I'm going to talk about, as Andrew said, representation stability for zero HECA modules. So as we go, um, I'm going to kind of try and keep this like very understandable, hopefully. Uh, and so I'll talk about uh, what exactly we'll get to what exactly I mean by representation stability in this setting. And as we go, I'll also kind of define exactly what a zero hecky module is um, and try and motivate why one might care about these things, hopefully. Um, so yeah. So as we're going, uh, when I define things, I'll often use examples as, as definitions rather than like the super rigorous definition, um, just because I think that they're more illuminating a lot of the time than the actual rigorous definition. Um, so always feel free to stop and ask me questions, obviously, as we're going. So we'll start off, we'll kind of have a motivating example throughout this talk. Uh, it'll reappear later on. Uh, and the example is going to be, we're going to have these uh, V sub ends, which are just going to be the polynomial ring and n variables. And we're just going to take the degree one part. So you could also think of this as just like an n-dimensional vector space if you wanted to. The reason that I'm doing this is because uh, the examples that we're considering, um, they would also work if you were to change that one to be any fixed degree. Uh, so that, that's the reason that I prefer this kind of notation. Um, so, but whatever you feel more comfortable with. Um, and this has a very natural action of the uh, symmetric group on it, right? Just permuting the different variables. Um, and so this is something, you know, if you just start studying representation theory, you would, you would see this. Uh, and just as kind of like a flash review, one of the most natural things that you might want to try and do is decompose uh, some representation of the symmetric group into its irreducibles, which you know is possible because the symmetric group is semi-simple. Um, and so all of the simple representations of the symmetric group are also indexed by partitions. So throughout this talk, I'll also kind of swap between kind of a combinatorial notation. Uh, in this case, it'd be like partitions correspond to these Young diagrams. Um, and uh, yeah, because the, I think the combinatorial picture is also more illuminating uh, to see what's happening. Um, so if we do that in this case, if we start to decompose these guys, the first one is just the trivial representation. And this will be represented by just a single block. The second case looks like this. So if anyone's kind of worked with this at all, I mean, this is like a very uh, elementary example. And the reason that I'm choosing it is because it, it's nice to start with elementary examples to get an idea of what, what exactly is going on. So if we go out a few steps, uh, we get this. Okay. Um, and so in each of these cases, as I was saying, these are uh, spec modules. So they're the irreducible uh, modules for the symmetric group. Um, and if we decompose each of these V sub i's into its irreducibles, and we kind of look at the, uh, the diagrams that represent the partitions, we get this decomposition. Uh, and what you can notice is that a, uh, a pattern starts to emerge here, right? So um, in this case, it's actually kind of a very nice or recognizable pattern. After the second step, all we're doing to get to the next step of the irreducible representations is we're just adding a box to the first row of the irreducible representations that appeared in the previous step. Right? And you add the, the appropriate number of boxes. So we had one box to go from two to three and then two boxes to go from two to four. But after this, uh, you can trust me or just, um, you know, you can think about it for a second and realize that this actually completely describes all of the representations as you go forward. Um, and so all you're going to do after the second step is you have a finite amount of information, namely these two partitions and some combinatorial rule, which is just adding a box, a nice one in this case. And it completely describes all the irreducibles that appear in these representations of the symmetric group as n grows. And so for us, this is what we'll call for now. We'll call this representation stability 
Um, and so there, there is a much more rigorous definition, but for us, and at least for now, uh, this is going to kind of be like the phenomena that we want to call representation stability, which is basically if you have some kind of compatible sequence of symmetric group representations. Uh, and in this case, they're, they also need to be kind of connected by transition maps, which in this case are just, you know, injecting the appropriate variables. Um, you get this, this stability phenomena where after a while, uh, you know, you have a finite list of, um, of permutations or of partitions, and then all you're doing is adding a box to the first row after this. And so uh, Church and Farb uh, noticed that this actually occurred um, in a lot of kind of natural sequences of symmetric group representations that one might care about. Uh, and so it's kind of a, a natural phenomenon that started to occur. And the, the kind of, it, it's not a very easy thing to prove on its surface. Like if you just look at this, to try and generally decompose a symmetric group representation into its irreducible constituents isn't always the easiest thing. And then also showing that they satisfy the stability is, all, is, is not easy. Uh, and so there's kind of a very natural question. Uh, is there something kind of more sitting behind this that would explain some kind of structure that would explain why this occurs? Uh, and it would explain why it occurs in kind of more examples. And the answer to this is yes. And it comes from uh, a category. So Church, Allenberg, and Farb define this category Fi. So this is a category where its objects are finite sets and morphisms are injections. And so uh, one reason that this could kind of potentially be a really good thing to look at is if we look at uh, the endomorphisms in Fi. And so we'll denote uh, the, a set of size n. So kind of up to equivalence, you can just, like if you consider kind of the skeleton of this category, you, you have one uh, object for each set of size n and we'll denote it by this n. You can notice that this is exactly the symmetric group. So injections from n to n exactly gives you the symmetric group. So in some sense, uh, FI seems to be a good way to understand kind of sequences of symmetric group representations. Uh, and we'll make this more concrete uh, by defining what we call an FI module. So an FI module uh, V is just a functor from FI to vector spaces. Uh, and for us, what we'll be considering is mainly just kind of complex vector spaces, but you know, you can replace that like much more broadly. Uh, but for sake of simplicity, we just want, I want you to think of like just complex vector spaces here. And so if you think of what an FI module gives you, the idea is that for each finite set N, you're getting a symmetric group representation. And then there are kind of transition maps between these symmetric group representations that are given by the different injections between sets of different sizes, right? Uh, and going forward, we will we'll use this standard notation, so v sub n to be v applied to the set. And, and so, you know, there was kind of suggested notation from the beginning. So what you can notice is that this kind of sequence of v sub i's gives you a very natural fi module, right? There's clearly a symmetric group action on each piece. The transition maps between them are just injections of variables. Um, but the hope is that this will be connected to representation stability in some sense. And just being an FI module is obviously not enough to be representation stable. Um, the, the next key idea here is this idea that we were kind of talking about where there's like a finite amount of information that kind of generates everything uh, up to a combinatorial rule. Um, and this is kind of the next, the, the big key here is these modules that are representation stable are exactly gonna be uh, the finitely generated FI modules. So we'll say quickly what we mean by uh, being finitely generated. So an FI module is finitely generated if there exists some V1, so some elements V1 to VK in these vector spaces such that um, such that they generate, so such that V is generated by them up to the FI action. So you take the smallest FI submodule that contains all of these things and it's, it's V. 
Um, and so you're allowed to act by the symmetric group and you're allowed to act by these transition maps. Um, and so that's what we mean when we say an FI module is finitely generated. Uh, and in this case, it's not very hard to see that this module is finitely generated just by uh, X1, because you can inject it to all of the other, uh, all of the other variables. Um, and so I guess I'll stop quickly. Are there any questions about these definitions? So the reason I'm going through them is because uh, we'll kind of do a parallel construction soon. And so it's important to kind of know these, these basic definitions of these things. Okay. So the big take home here was a theorem due to Church, Allenberg, and Farb. Around about 2012, that says that V is a finitely generated FI module if and only if VN is rep stable. And so, once again, here I'm still only considering kind of complex vector spaces. There are way more general statements that you can make, um, but this is going to be kind of the take home here is that. Uh, you have these kind of natural sequences of symmetric group representations. And the idea is that their, their kind of structure can be encoded by this combinatorial category Fi. Um, and being representation stable, so having this really nice property of being rep stable, is the same thing as being finitely generated for that Fi module structure. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of a very powerful tool, and it makes it makes showing that things are representation stable like significantly easier. It is way easier to show that something is a finitely generated FI module in general than to actually try and decompose it into irreducibles and show it satisfies this stability. Um, and so, you know, a lot of research came uh, from from this. Uh, we'll kind of get to the motivation of like the step that I want to kind of take towards the zero Hecke modules. Um, so there were a lot of different directions that people went in after this. So there are different directions, different research directions. Um, one way that you can go is let's try and essentially study things that are similar to FI, right? So we can, you know, still kind of try and fix the symmetric group. Uh, and maybe we get other categories by adding more structure. Uh, and so this, this gave birth to like categories like VI, uh, FIG, uh, FID, and in general, like categories. So um, Nir, I think, talked about or like studied categories of FI type. So you can make this very general. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of research done in this direction, studying these types of categories. Uh, and you can also other categories like FSA out of this. Um, and so there's a whole like long list of categories along this line. Um, and then there's another direction that you can go in where you could ask, uh, maybe we want to try and replace the symmetric group with something else. Um, and so you can replace it with uh, linear groups or vial groups. So replace SN with something else. Um, and in general, like the, the way that I like to think about this is, um, you know, it's nice to consider sequences of kind of spaces that have some kind of complete symmetry on them, some symmetric group action. But, you know, those clearly aren't all spaces. Uh, and one kind of immediate example of something like this, uh, which is hopefully going to segue or convince you that we should care about the zero Hecke algebra actions here, is uh, comes from a theorem. So another kind of category that people studied in here was this category called OI, uh, which is ordered sets with injections. So you essentially take away the symmetric group action. And so there was a theorem of uh, Putman, Sam and Snowden. And I'm not gonna like, you know, very explicitly define the action that they gave, but what they showed is if you fix some I, greater than equal to zero. And you consider the homology of the unipotent groups with coefficients and defining characteristic. So this is a finitely generated, or it has a finitely generated OI module structure. 
So this is like a very, very non-trivial thing to show. Um, but the idea is that if you consider these things, there is a way to turn them into an OI module. Uh, and it's also finitely generated as an OI module. And now uh, this was kind of one of the motivating ideas for uh, like what I start to think about. Uh, if you look at this, if you just think about like what unipotent matrices, right? It's like upper triangular matrices in general. Uh, it's not obvious that there should be kind of any symmetric group representation on that, right? Like you, you wouldn't think like if you try shifting uh, entries around in a upper triangular matrix that, that you would have any success uh, getting a, a representation of the symmetric group. But OI is kind of saying like, okay, we have the sequence of, uh, of spaces and we're essentially saying that we don't want to consider like any structure on them other than the fact that they kind of map into each other, right? Um, and so being an OI module tells you a lot. Like it tells you, for instance, that these things eventually grow like polynomials, which is really nice. Uh, but if there were more structure, uh, it's possible that we could try to say more about sequences like this. And in general, we can think about sequences of kind of naturally connected spaces uh, that have like partial symmetries on them rather than, um, rather than like a complete symmetry. And so one of the motivations for where to look or where to go from here to try and find this kind of intermediary between FI and OI is uh, actually in symmetric function theory. So in symmetric function theory, uh, I'm gonna draw a loose kind of heuristic diagram. So FI has the close connection to the ring of symmetric functions. And this is really natural if you've studied symmetric group representations there's a very, very nice connection to the ring of symmetric functions, right? And kind of on the other side of things, we have OI. And we can kind of think of this as being connected to the, to the ring of non-commutative symmetric functions. Um, and so, you know, the, the question is like, what we want on the top end is something that's in between these two. And the nice thing is that on the bottom end, there is a natural thing that sits in between these two. And the natural thing is the ring of quasi-symmetric functions. And so symmetric functions um, are just uh, polynomials that are preserved under kind of permuting the variables in any way that you could imagine. Uh, the ring of quasi-symmetric polynomials actually like perfectly encapsulates this idea of an upward uh, stability. So the idea is that they are, uh, they're fixed under kind of upward shifts of variables. So you, you don't necessarily go back down. Um, and so, the major thing that I wanted to ask was what, what kind of goes here potentially, and can it play the role that we want it to play in kind of sitting in between OI and FI to kind of understand these kind of sequences of, of uh, spaces that have kind of an upward symmetry on them. Uh, and the answer for where to look is if we know that the symmetric group is connected here, there's a very similar theory connecting zero Hecke algebras to the ring of quasi-symmetric functions. So there's similarly like a characteristic map. There are actually two uh, that, that map into the ring of quasi-symmetric functions uh, that plays a similar role to the symmetric group for the symmetric functions. And so the, the good guess for what might go here is some kind of analog of FI, but for zero Hecke, uh, zero Hecke modules. So are there any questions at this point, hopefully? I've maybe motivated you to, to care about this a little bit, the zero Hecke modules a little bit more, because um, that's where we're going next. So, so my main question is, what is QSIM? I didn't really understand a different- Oh yeah, so QSIM, QSIM it's, uh, it contains the ring of symmetric functions. So it's, it's polynomials that are uh, stable under uh, upward shifts of variables. Um, and so right, like you can send, you know, you can think of like applying increasing maps to them, but not decreasing ones. Um, so, so that means I, if I have something like uh, x1, x2, x3, then I can also have x2 squared x3. Is that what it means? No. So it, it has to. So like with the symmetric group, where you have to permute. So it has to be like a, an element from the. Uh, the increasing mono. And so it has to like, everything has to increase up. So if you had like X1, X2, X3, you could have like X2, X3, X4. And so like a, a simple example of like a, a quasi-symmetric function that's not symmetric would be like if you took a symmetric function and you shifted all of the, all of the index, 
indexing up by one, um, that would be quasi symmetric. Like, so for example, if you got rid of one, like you replaced one by two and two by three, um, that would be quasi symmetric, but it clearly wouldn't be symmetric because uh, it doesn't contain all the things where you swap down, if that makes sense. Oh, so so it's 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 a it's a sub of the non-symmetric in that way. Okay. Yes, exactly. Thanks. Yeah. So there's this kind of containment. So uh, sim is contained in QSIM, and all of these kind of are in n sim. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions about this? There's been, I mean, the ring of quasi-symmetric functions won't really come up all that much more. It's mainly a motivator. Uh, and it's kind of a cool thing to talk about because it, it sits underneath a lot of what will happen uh, as we're going forward. Um, but we don't really need to understand it all that well. But there is a very similar theory of, uh, you know, like people understand uh, quasi-symmetric sure functions. People have studied these in like the corresponding uh, zero Hecke modules. And um, there's been like a whole recent theory kind of developed around this that's pretty interesting. So when you wrote down like FI and SIM, should I be thinking like TCA stuff there or is that not what I should be thinking? So you can think that like the TCA stuff gives you a really nice connection to, uh, to SIM. But for this, you don't necessarily need to think TCA stuff. Um, yeah, so I haven't been able to come up with kind of like a, a TCA uh, analog of this category that I'm going to tell you about soon. Um, but yeah, so like one of the one of the reasons that I can kind of or that you can kind of draw this error outside of just the connection of the symmetric or of a SN to to SIM is through TCAs. Like there's a really cool connection that TCAs show you. Um, so yeah, if you know more about that, you can think that, but you don't necessarily need to, I guess is the question that or the way that I'd answer that. Any other questions at this point? Okay. So kind of with this like motivation in mind, we're gonna to start to step into uh, trying to understand like what rep stability might mean in the zero Hecke setting. Uh, and so to do that, I will tell you what uh, zero, the zero Hecke algebra is. So for anyone that's been in the, the Otter seminar, you miss, you know about Hecke algebras, uh, but I will uh, kind of redefine them in, in type A. That's going to be the main thing that we care about. Um, and I'll, I'll get to kind of talking about what a zero Hecke algebra is so that we can, you know, kind of go forward from there. Cause I know a lot of people aren't always familiar with this stuff. Um, I certainly wasn't before this. So for a given N of a Hecke algebra, so Q is going to be a, a, a parameter. So N is an integer, Q is going to be a parameter. The Hecke algebra HN of Q uh, is going to be generated as an algebra by pi one through pi n minus one, subject to the following relations. So, kind of the way to the way to think about this in type A is that uh, the symmetric group algebra is kind of in type A is part of a family of these Hecke algebras. And it will be for it, it will exactly appear for a certain choice of this parameter. In particular, be when Q equals one. Um, and you know, in general, though, we can kind of make Q uh, anything that we really want to. And so uh, we'll define this generally. So it's the Hecke algebra is generated by pi one through pi n, subject to the following relations. So these first ones should seem very familiar for anyone who's kind of worked with the symmetric group at all. Uh, so this is the way to think about these pi i's is kind of like uh, the transpositions, like the basic transpositions that swap i and i plus one. So this tells you that they have to commute if the distance between i and j is more than one. Uh, the next kind of very natural relation is uh, this is often called the braid relation. 
Um, and then the new, the kind of new interesting thing that you have to impose is this relation. So. I just wanna make sure I get this right. I always reverse the, the one minus Q. So these, this is exactly how you define the Hecke algebra um, or one way to define it. It pops up in a lot of really interesting places. And, but for our, for our purpose, just to be simple, this is how you define it. And what you can notice is that when Q equals one, if we're saying again, that we're working over the complex numbers, you exactly recover the symmetric group algebra. Cause when you plug Q equals one to this, it tells you the generator square to be one, right? Um, and for other kind of integer values, so when Q is non-zero and an integer, uh, it's not very interesting. So this, could, this might motivate just why looking at zero-heck algebras in general is kind of like a potentially interesting next step. Um, so, but what I mean by not interesting is that the representation theory is like identical to the representation theory for the symmetric group. So they're all semi-simple um, and all of their irreducibles are indexed by, uh, by partitions. Um, and so like the exact same thing follows. Uh, and so one of the most kind of first interesting cases is uh, when Q equals zero. And this is the zero heck algebra. And this is kind of the thing that we're going to care about. And you know what you might notice is if you let Q equal zero, uh, this tells you that a generator squares to itself, right? So pi I squared is, is pi I. Um, and there's if you if you've seen these at all, there are often two different sets of uh, generators that people consider. Um, one of them has the generator squaring to be like negative the generator, um, but it's it's equivalent. Um, if you just take like one minus one. You, one minus one of the generating sets, you get the other generating sets. So this is, but this is the one that we're going to work with. Um, so are there any questions about this so far? This is this is the uh, the zero Hecke algebra. So, what happens when Q is a complex number? Like I know, at least like homologically, it, this behaves like the symmetric group when Q is not a root of unity, and then is interesting for roots of unity for, from like the representation theory side, is that similar? You're saying is that similar when it's like a, a random complex number? If it's a random complex number, is it boring except when it's uh, zero or root of unity? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I, I would think the answer is no. Um, the root of unity case is definitely interesting. It's like another degenerate case, but I'd assume there are other ones outside of that, but I'm not. That's it. It's zero and, and oh, that's it. Zero and everything else is boring. Less than n. Uh, yeah, everything else is boring. Everything else is semi simple and isomorphic to the symmetric group algebra. There you go. So, yeah. So, just, yeah, just the roots of unity and zero. And the roots of unity case is very uh, like odd. The, I mean, it's, it's somewhat understood, but we'll see that the zero Hecke algebra case is actually like fairly well understood now. So, the Q equals zero case. Oh, any other questions about this? Okay. So I'll quickly just review. Oh, let's see. In the, the last relation, should there be a square? Are you so this this is a square if my, my handwriting is horrendous. Do you mean somewhere over here? Or this is supposed to be a two. It's not much better, but. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's saying that like it tells you, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. There shouldn't be a square on this side. This side's definitely uh, like as it should be. Right. Any other questions? Okay, so I'll quickly review just some of the, the basic kind of rep theory of the zero Hecke algebra that we'll need going forward. Uh, and I'll kind of, you know, very, very quickly review. So the zero Hecke algebra is not semi simple. 
which makes it kind of one of the first like interesting cases that we might consider. Um, and it also kind of leads to the question of like, you know, what, what might it mean to be representation stable? I mean, we've developed further ideas of like representation stability just in terms of being finally generated for a category, but like even in terms of the representations or the irreducible representations, what would it mean to be, uh, you know, representation stable if you don't have some simplicity? So we'll kind of talk about like potentially the right way to look at that. Um, so that's kind of one thing, but the nice thing is we completely understand the irreducibles. The irreducibles in this case are indexed by compositions. By compositions of N. And so we'll write alpha as a composition of N where alpha is a, um, a composition. And so what a composition is, is it's just a way of writing N as a sum of some numbers. And so to kind of illustrate this, uh, I'll once again kind of go to an example to hopefully make this more clear. Um, and so we'll write these as C alpha. And so this is due to, uh, this is due to Norton. In her thesis, I think in about the 70s, somewhere in there. So she completely uh, classified all the irreducibles of zero Hecke algebra. She said that they correspond to compositions of N. Um, and once again, as, as we did for the um, symmetric group, we'd like to kind of understand compositions in terms of a more combinatorial picture, because uh, that hopefully will lead to some kind of pattern. Um, so we'll write these as C alpha and encode or like realize alpha as a as a ribbon diagram. And I will show what this is in an example, because uh, I think that's the easiest way to kind of understand it. So are there any like questions? The, the major thing to take home here is that zero Hecke algebra is not semi-simple anymore. It's, but we do completely understand it's irreducibles. In particular, they're completely indexed by compositions of N. Uh, and we can think of these compositions, or we should think of these compositions as, as ribbon diagrams. Um, and I will tell you what that is right now. I have a question. Yes. Um, is it obvious that, uh, I guess, when Q is not one, that, I mean, are these things even finite dimensional? When Q is not equal to one? Yeah. Is it, you're saying, is it obvious why, uh, like, the representation theory is, is uh, not interesting? No, no. I'm saying, like, is the algebra finite dimensional? In the case that Q is not equal to one? Yeah. I believe so. I mean. It's like a flat family over Q, right? The dimensions are yeah. constant, I think. Yeah. It's always N factorial, yeah. Yeah, that's. The variable, sure I wasn't like. the generators commute and they square to something smaller, so. Uh, but they don't commute if they're adjacent is the, and like. Right. If, if they're not invertible, like in, when Q is zero, you can't necessarily just like multiply so you can use the braid relations. Anyways, if, if it's not relevant, I don't want to get sidetracked. I just wanted to ask. Yeah. Yeah, it won't, it won't be relevant, but I do believe that they are finite dimensional for, I think for the reason that, that Andrew is talking about. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm sure there are people who know way more about Hecke algebras in general uh, than I do, I'm sure. But, uh, but yeah, they are really interesting kind of in their own, their own right. But yeah, are there any other questions about this before we move on? Okay. Um, so the, the first example that I wanna kind of give is we're gonna consider the composition So we're gonna consider this composition of six. Um, so obviously you can write six as two plus one plus three. Uh, and so we wanna think about this composition as the following ribbon diagram. Uh, and this picture will allow me to kind of better explain what a ribbon diagram is. So a ribbon diagram is going to be a diagram of boxes of this sort that has no two by two square in it. Um, and uh, 
And yeah, it has to kind of always be moving to the side. And so people, I've seen different ways to kind of go between compositions and ribbon diagrams. Uh, and the way that I'm going to stick to is you'll start with the first entry and you'll work kind of from the bottom up and from left to right. And so you put this many boxes first and then to get to the next row. So the next number is a new row and you start uh, above the last box of the, uh, the previous row and you add that many new boxes and you keep going. And in that way, it's not hard to see that you end up getting a diagram with no two by two boxes. Um, and it's very easy to go back and forth between these two. So are there any questions about how you kind of encode this? This is gonna kind of be like the analog of, you know, partitions and uh, young diagrams. Okay. So kind of with all this setup in mind, uh, a lot of it does seem similar to the symmetric group and that, you know, that's kind of a promising thing. Uh, there's kind of a, you know, the natural question that would come up is, is there a form of rep stability here? And if so, is there like a, is there an analogous category to FI? Um, and you know this this talk, I guess, wouldn't be all that interesting if the answers to this were no. It would kind of end here. So the answers the answers are yes. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll explain what or like how exactly you answer them. Um, so yeah. So this this brings us to uh, the zero hecate category, as to where we wanted to get. Or at least that's what I call it. Uh, and so just like we did with FI, I want to return to our kind of handy dandy example. So remember, uh, and what we're going to do in this case is the exact same thing that we did for FI to try and get a picture of what rep stability might mean here. And so what you can notice is that there's actually, I wouldn't call it a natural action, but there is an action of the zero Hecke algebra on this. Uh, and it acts by these things called de majeure operators. So pi i of f, this is how it's going to act. And I'll tell you what this, this means after I write it all down. So these are de majeure operators. For anyone who might know more about them. Uh, but the basic idea is here you multiply f by xi, and then this si is just the transposition that swaps i and i plus one. And so it's not hard to see that this will indeed uh, divide this. Uh, and just as an example, we could see that pi one of x one is x one plus x two. So that's kind of like one of the most basic examples that we could come up with. Um, so yeah, and so what you can do is you can go through and check that uh, if you allow the, the different pi's tack like this and you kind of extend, um, because these are the generators, uh, that these generators actually do satisfy the appropriate relations that they'd need to, um, to give you a, a zero Hecke action. Um, so yeah, and most importantly, if you apply one twice, uh, you, you end up just getting what you get if you'd applied it once. So you can check that in this, this kind of basic example too. But are there any questions about this, this action? Are, are these modules going to be free, just like in the FI case? Yes. Yeah, I believe they will be. Yeah, but it's not, it's not as obvious, but yeah. Um, yeah. I think the answer is yes. I have to think about that for a second, but yeah, I think I think the answer is yes. Are there any other questions about this? This is this action is a little bit more like odd, um, but I guess that kind of makes sense. And what I guess you can kind of see is like there is some kind of like upward shift here, uh, and the idea is that you can't go back. That's kind of like the if you're thinking about this very heuristically, 
um, you know, if you apply this again, you get the same thing. And so there's no going back to X1 after you apply pi one. Um, yeah. Any other questions here? Okay. So what I want to do, the kind of, I guess the natural thing to do, we'd like to ask the question of like what irreducibles are appearing. Cause it's like the similar question that we asked in the FI case. Um, but you can't do that like on its face just because you don't have so much simplicity anymore. But what we can do is we can look in the growth index group. So we're going to decompose. We're going to decompose these in the growth index group. Um, and there we're just more or less asking the exact question of what irreducibles are actually appearing in these representations. And so that's the nice thing about these is that they're, that they're something that's very easy to work with. Um, and so I'm going to suppress this kind of bracket on the right hand side just for, for ease of notation, but everything we're doing here is in the growth and decrease group because these things no longer decompose as we'd like them to. Um, so once again, I'm going to use compositions to, uh, to denote these kind of irreducibles. So if we start to decompose them, it looks similar at first. But then things start to kind of go wrong. And this is something that we would expect. Um, and we'll go out one more step just to hopefully. Feels so wrong. <laughs> what? It feels so wrong. I know, right? <laughs> There's a purpose, though, I swear. Um, so. <laughs> We'll see, we'll see it actually, it feels wrong, but it ends up kind of, it ends up looking right. Um, maybe, maybe I can convince you of that. Um, okay, so another fact that I didn't, I don't think I mentioned is that all of these C alphas are actually one dimensional, um, which does actually end up being important when you're trying to prove some of the, the results that I'll talk about. Um, but the idea is that like, you know, before for FI, we got to a certain point where we had a finite list of combinatorial or a finite list of data, namely the, the partitions and a combinatorial rule, namely just adding a box to the first row that gave us everything. Um, but one of the important things is that the irreducible modules there, they actually increase in dimension, right? And so it makes sense that like, you just end up having a finite number of them after a while. And if that number is fixed, that can't happen here unless we actually get stabilization in the dimensions of these VIs, right? Because these irreducibles are all one dimensional. And so they, we have to get more and more of them. Um, and so I claim that there is actually a, uh, a pattern kind of emerging here. And maybe some people can see it. It wasn't immediately obvious to me um, what was happening, but there is a pattern. Uh, and before I can exactly tell you what it is, uh, I need to give you another definition by example. So- Hey, um, Robert, can I ask a, a quick question? Yeah. So I'm so I, I I'm vaguely familiar with a different labeling of the irreducibles by like subsets of n. Can you what is the like combinatorics of going between these two labelings? Oh, the connection so yet. Um or like what does this look like in, in that language? <laughs> So yeah, you can phrase all this in terms of like descent sets. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. I don't, I'm, I don't know which. Yeah, sure. Descent. <laughs> yeah, you can. That's a, so, a of, of your places. Uh, sure. Yeah. So the, the idea is that like descent sets are places in your, where you would kind of like decrease. Um, and the way to kind of think about like the compositions here in terms of the descent sets is you kind of, if you're walking through your composition, you kind of go up every time you descend. So like this would be, this corresponds to like increasing. And then, so like, it's like an, uh, an increase of like two things and then you descend for one thing. Um, and we can, we could talk about this more after. So there is like the, the way that quasi-symmetric functions are often phrased is in terms of these descent sets. And it's kind of translating between descent sets and this language of compositions that gives you the kind of the rule that I'm going to talk about soon for how you would kind of get uh, generation in this case. Thanks. 
yeah um so yeah there's a lot of kind of like swapping around of language here that you know depending upon the situation you're in uh you want to use different language so I'm, I'm running short on time so i'll quickly try and say what this uh what this definition is and i'll, I'll try and get to the um the the punch line here so if we return back to 213 what i'd like to do is um talk about this this operation of adding a box to uh, the second position. So I want to talk about adding boxes to positions. This is kind of how I phrased it. So we have two, one, three, and in a composition of size n, I want to um, add, there are n plus one positions that you could add boxes in. Um, and the positions are, they start to the left of the first box and then kind of the nth position corresponds to adding a box above the n minus first uh, box. And so I'll, I'll kind of show you what I mean by adding a box to the second position. So the second position would be above this box. And then there's kind of a natural way of shifting things to maintain a ribbon tableau. So we add this box above this position. Um, and then here we have to kind of shift everything up. Um, so I'd be happy to talk more about this, uh, maybe in the, the uh, discussion afterwards, but there's kind of this natural, th and this actually comes from translating between that descent set language and uh, these compositions, this idea of adding a box to a certain position. Um, and so what I want to say here is that the, the pattern that we get uh, is actually, we once again, we'll have a finite list of compositions and then what we want to do is add boxes to every possible position in, uh, in these diagrams. So in this case, if we start with just this composition, if we add a box to position one, we get this, and to position two, we get this. And then in the, the next step after this, we, had, we can add two boxes to position one, one to one, one to two, or two boxes to position two. And so if you kind of look at the picture, it's not a terribly, it sounds more complicated than it is. It's this idea of just adding boxes in all possible ways to all the different positions. And so this, this is going to be our new combinatorial rule for how we'll kind of generate other irreducibles from a starting irreducible. Uh, and this is actually what we'll mean. So this is rep stability. So again, the idea is that we have a finite list of data, namely a finite list of compositions and a combinatorial rule for adding boxes to these compositions that after a certain point will generate all of the irreducibles that you would see in your representations of the zero heck algebra as you're going. Um, so yeah, are there any, are there any questions about this? Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of quickly remark at, um, that this actually comes from a variant of the Pieri rule for quasi-symmetric functions. So that's kind of the idea that like Nate was bringing up this connection to descent sets. They phrase like a Pieri rule for quasi-symmetric functions in terms of descent sets. And if you interpret that in terms of these compositions and this, this language, you get this, this notion of adding boxes. So this kind of combinatorial operation. Um, and there's kind of a really cool theory there. Um, and so, I'll just quickly kind of end with a theorem. So there is, there's a category underlying this that I don't necessarily have time to define. Uh, and it's not incredibly complicated once you kind of have this set up. The idea is that the objects are again finite sets. And then the morphisms between things are uh, like braid diagrams where you're imposing the relation that like a, a braid squares to itself. Um, and so that, that gives you the, a new category uh, which we call like the zero Hecke category. And the idea is that that zero Hecke category, once again, uh, completely um, encapsulates kind of this idea, this new idea of rep stability. So V is a finitely generated ACE module where this is kind of this new category. And the idea is it's, it's the kind of the natural category that you would construct where the endomorphisms give you the zero Hecke algebra. Um, so V is a finitely generated H module. This tells you that uh, this sequence is rep stable in this new sense. So you kind of get this really cool way of understanding uh, the irreducibles that appear. Um, and I'll just state kind of one more theorem, which kind of wraps everything up. So um, 
you fix an i greater than or equal to zero, these do end up being, so this is a finitely generated H module. And so this, this category H that is given by these zero Hecke modules is actually the right thing to look at if you're trying to understand potentially more structure on um, this kind of sequence of, of homology. Uh, and the proof actually isn't that hard once you have the whole setup, because you basically just have to argue that the, the action kind of agrees with the OI action when you restrict. Uh, and then you get finite generation for free. But the nice thing is you get kind of more results. In particular, you get um, this kind of rep stability language. Uh, and I kind of proved some other structure about H. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm out of time for now. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Bobby. Um, questions? I have a couple of questions to start. Yeah. Um, it, can you then look at these uh, homologies that you've written down at the bottom and maybe try to decompose a few of them? Is that something that's feasible? Um, it might be. I haven't tried to actually, but it is something that you could try to do potentially in, in very basic cases. Um, yeah, that might actually be worthwhile to do, but yeah, I haven't, I, I haven't thought about that yet. Um, yeah, to, to explicitly show. Uh, second question, I'm going to put in the chat, there is a paper in 2018 that, claim, that, that did something kind of similar, like rep stability for Hecke algebras. Not zero Hecke, but like Q. Um, and I was wondering if you, how, how your work interacts with theirs. So I'm going to leave that for you later. Yeah, I'll have to look at that. So these uh, uh, modules over this this sort of zero hecka fi category. Um, you said you still get kind of representation stability in this sense. Do you have uh, like polynomial dimensions and and that sort of stuff as well? And can yeah, so all of that does follow. Like the the way that you kind of prove this, or the way that I like kind of prove this result is you construct like induced modules again, um, and you kind of show that uh, it's so there's it's slightly more complicated because the induced modules don't give you uh, like a basis for your growth and degroup anymore. Um, so you have to, there, there's a couple more things you have to do, but basically you construct a basis for the growth and degroup in terms of these like induced modules. Um, and you, you show that they're a basis. Uh, and then you, yeah, you get the polynomial dimension growth just comes from like understanding these induced modules basically. Great. Um, so yeah, you, you get all those results. If you just want polynomial growth, you can restrict to OI. Yeah, that's also true. OI is, yeah. Kind of the basic the underlying thing. Finally generated HECA restricts the finally generated OI, right? Sure. Yep. Yeah. So my uh, sort of fo follow up question with that is, uh, so you can you can take a um, a module for the symmetric group, and uh, and then kind of deform deform it away, move move Q. So you get, you get a family of, of modules uh, for, for all values of Q. Uh, and then in particular, but at Q equals zero, it's, it's maybe not irreducible anymore. It's, I mean, it's, it's definitely not irreducible anymore. Um, and so one thing, so, so these, these give us some, some sort of notion of like uh, spec modules for the zero Hecke algebra. And so one thing that happens for FI modules in characteristic P is you can always express things as a, uh, a kind of a virtual sum of, of spec modules. Uh, and it seems like that might happen here too. Uh, that, that these are kind of uh, at least virtually gonna look like 
characters of fi modules deformed to q equals zero. zero. Something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. This kind of goes like a lot bigger than fi. Like, aren't there like a lot more modules for the HECA category than for fi? Yeah. So that, that's one of the kind of other potentially, I don't know, maybe interesting things that you could say about this is like, even, even this example, like the, the kind of idea that I have is basically like there, there are, or there should be kind of more modules for, um, for this category than there are for FI because there are spaces that are kind of, this is like a very heuristic and I have no actual way to kind of prove this. Um, but like spaces that have kind of a complete symmetry on them, there's usually, or there seems to usually be a way to kind of get a partial symmetry. So it's like when you have an FI module, a lot of the times they actually turn out to be modules for this category. Um, but there are examples like such as this one. And if you look at uh, quasi-symmetric sure, func uh, quasi sure functions and the corresponding modules um, that like don't have a natural FI structure, but do, um, do give you age modules. Yeah, my point uh, so was just that, that the fact that there's so many more modules makes me skeptical of the thing that Nate wanted to be true. Yeah. Can you get, uh, other than, other than say, just like the sequence of, of trivial representations, can you get like these sort of generalized FI modules uh, where it's just one dimensional in each uh, position, but it's not the, it's not the, the trivial? Was that? Yeah, I mean, so can, can you get in, in this set of, are there, are there modules for this where kind of point wise, it looks just like a single irreducible representation in each degree. So it's, it's one dimensional, uh, but it's not just the, the horizontal uh, partition. Um. For this category, I believe you. I don't actually know. I'd have to think about that. Um, oh yeah, and thanks, Stephen, for answering that question. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. I would. I would think maybe. Um, But yeah, I can't think of like an immediate example, like off the bat. Um, yeah, because the way these induced modules work is like you you do. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. There there are modules that you can take where that yeah that would happen. So like, I define these things called padded induced modules in the in the paper, and they're quotients of the induced modules, and the idea is that you take a shape. Um, whatever shape you might want, and you essentially restrict yourself, you can restrict yourself to adding boxes only above a certain row. Um, and so if you took kind of any of these shapes you wanted, you could get an H module that was one dimensional for every N, where you just are adding a box to kind of the, the first row or the top row of that. And that's not just like the, the trivial representation. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what that corresponds to, but there are ways to kind of cook up like these, these kind of weird uh, examples of just sequences of a lot of like one dimensional reps. I don't know if that actually answers your question, but. <laughs> no, it um, okay, so since it's two o'clock now, I think uh, we'll officially uh, end the seminar. So let's thank Bobby again. Um, and well, if you want to stick around, at least some of us will stick around and keep talking, but feel free to leave if you don't want to. Uh, and we hope to continue tapers um, uh, next semester after the new year. Uh, Jenny and I will send out more information about that at some point. So I'm going to stop recording now and please stick around if you want. Otherwise, leave.